Well, welcome back to today's Dairy Signal. Can you believe it already that this is episode 141 of the Dairy Signal? So if anybody asks, what the heck have you been doing this year? I can say we've been doing the Dairy Signal. And we have an opportunity today to bring back a friend of ours, and that's Liz Griffith. And Liz is with Encore Consultants. We'd also like to say thank you to Encore Consultants for being a sponsor of not only today's episode of the Dairy Signal, but working with us and underwriting this program for the next two weeks. We really appreciate that. And it's partners like Encore and all of our other industry partners that allow us to bring the Dairy Signal out to the dairy community um, at no cost. So your investment today is time, people, and an opportunity to really lean in and own this program as our friends, our neighbors, and our community of dairy. So today we've got some fun facts as we move forward. But before we do that, I'm going to plug a little bit of a reminder for all of you. And it goes to what can you get out of today's program? Well, we're going to focus on family and management and putting family and business together. You know, you're supposed to keep all those worlds separate, right? Do we do that in the dairy industry? No, because a lot of times we've grown up with the family dairy and we've got multiple generations in these businesses and it just all gets mixed together. So as you're listening today, if there's something that resonates and you want to ask a question, today is the perfect opportunity for you to do that and nobody will have any idea who asked that question. But you can get out of this program exactly what you want. And we've got Liz here to kind of talk us through. She's got lots of experience and has been working in the consulting wheel for a long time that she can help us. So today in history, some really significant things. It was in 1808 that the U.S. Congress abolished the African slave trade, 1808. Um, and then it was in 1836 that Texas, and we talked about Texas and the revolution uh, last week, but that they officially declared their independence of Mexico. So, you know, that is something that's way back in the U.S. history, but would have happened in this day in 1836. On kind of a fun note, I'm going to see who can figure this one out. It was on this day that Theodore Gisele, that's G-E-I-S-E-L, was born. And what is he famous for? Does anyone know? I'll give you a little bit of a clue. And it's uh, redfish, bluefish, one fish, two fish. Or a great saying that I like that, that I think applies to dairy farming. Kid, you'll move mountains. You are off to a great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting. So get on your way. Liz, come on, help them out. <laughs> Who was that? that? Oh, no, you just threw me off. Dr. Seuss. It was Dr. Seuss. And think about how our, uh, you know, the, the use of language in those words. But I think probably all of us as kids, we can come up with a certain part of what um, was written by the famous Dr. Seuss. And on this day for him to have a birthday and nobody to really remember probably his given name, but to remember his professional name is pretty remarkable. He left his stamp on all of us. Um, and I think that we can all recite at least part of it. If not when we're children, definitely when we're parents, our kids would memorize those books. And when you try to skip the pages so you could go to sleep, they would catch us because they knew them. So today we are going to hunker in and we're going to talk about family management or family and management and the family business. And Liz, what are some of the things that we're going to really pick out of today that um, you want to flag as we get started? What are we going to learn? I think, you know, first of all, talking about shared vision, shared values, and if you have the right people in the right seats. And I know we've talked about that before, but we tend to do that with our employees and not so much the family members. So we're going to kind of address that today. Family is a tough one. You know, employees come into your life and, you know, they, the seats you know are going to be expected to change from time to time. That People are going to grow and, and change and leave and go on to other positions. Family, you inherit family and, and family inherits us. So that makes it a little bit more difficult. Right. Okay. And there's well, definitely pros and cons to family, so. <laughs> yes, there is. 
Good. Well, I'm going to hand it off to you and you take us through this. You know, the one thing about the dairy industry, they say 98% of our business across the U.S. dairy farms are all family businesses, family owned. And, you know, I've, I'm sure there's other sectors of our economy that are similar, but I think within agriculture, it's just expected. I mean, we all, many of us grew up that way, but I wonder what other businesses in the general economy are similar to that you know not offhand but i mean i'm sure there's others you know but offhand i just automatically think of agriculture you know even all aspects not just dairy but all okay. aspects of ag it certainly builds in some resiliency when we go through tough times and it certainly builds in more stress from time to time so from that i'm just going to have you leap off and and you take this presentation, this time today, wherever you want, and I'm going to remind anybody who has the honor right now or privilege of live streaming with Liz to hop in here. Go to Slido.com or go to that handy-dandy PDPW app. You've got Slido right on there. Or if you're following along and live streaming, you can ask your questions. Either way, the questions will come in anonymous. They'll come up on the screen, and I'll read you, read Liz the question as they come through. So, Liz? Okay. And yeah, I, I just want to kind of add more to that. You know, what I'm going to share today is just little bits of everything, right? Some little little tools, if you will, for your toolbox. But we want your questions because each situation is different. And, you know, we may not have all the answers, but we can walk through some options. So don't hesitate to interrupt and, and ask a question. So as, you know, Shelley alluded to, we're, we're kind of talking about a common but difficult topic, and that's family and management. I say common because, as Shelley said, 98% of farms are family-owned. We want our family to be part of our business. Um, typically, that's why we continue the legacy, right, to have the next generation be a part of it. So I certainly don't want you to get the impression in what I'm sharing today that I'm against family farms. I am 100% for family farms, but we just have to look at new ways to deal with some of the issues and conflicts and changes. So kind of want to talk about, like I said, family and management. Do they go together? And if so, how? So I'm sure everyone listening today has a story about a family member in their business and, and what happened. Um, we all have that. You know, we can talk about quote unquote Roger, if you will, who is automatically put in charge of the farm and his brothers were irate because there was no discussion. Um, Roger probably let it go to his head and maybe took more control than he should have. We can address Sally who wanted a job so bad out of college and she was just given one. Um, did she have the skills? We don't know. But we know she was treated different. And then the other employees got very angered and jealous. So created some issues there. And there's always Bob. Bob was put in charge of the employees. That's what he was hired for. You know, he was the nephew. They thought he'd be good. But he lacked the skills. And so all of those issues and, and stories you can come up with they wreak havoc in areas. So it's a cycle that happens all the time. So we want to just talk about it. So a little known fact here is 83% of family farms don't make it to the third generation. That's kind of scary as we all sit here, right? And why is that? The root cause of this failure is really a lack of a shared vision. We're all different. We're now in the third generation. So what that means is the family doesn't share the same idea of what success looks like for them and for the business. Everyone has their own ideas and nobody's talking about it. We should never assume as parents or grandparents that our kids, our, our nephews, nieces, whoever, share the same ideas of what we think success looks like. We sh shouldn't assume that they share our exact same work ethic, our exact same values. 
Because again, we all want different things. And that comes from that generational change. What we're, you know, exp what we've experienced in our life, what we see, what we hear, it changes that. So again, it's the generational differences. And that could be s simple things such as time off, wages, family obligations. I kind of like to go back, you know, to even when I was a young dairy producer, we didn't ask for much time off, but we wanted some. And what we asked for off was more than our parents wanted off. Now we see our children taking more time off, stepping away from the farm. So again, just some of those generational differences. So what we want to talk about is a family farm vision. What is a vision statement? Most of you probably know. Most of you may have had have one, but have you ever tweaked it? A vision statement describes how your family or business will look in the future. You know, you could use words such as sustainable, environmentally friendly, producer of quality milk, embrace technology. A vision can also include things like time off to enjoy our family, hobbies, friends. Maybe it's a certain wage or benefit that you're striving for. Or it can also even include your future roles. So when you're talking about family vision with the family, because this shouldn't just be one person who creates the vision, you want to answer, you want your vision to answer these following questions. What do I want my farm or business to be? What do I really want in life? How do I want to be seen or thought of when I interact with others, such as your employees or vendors or advisors? What values are most important and will never be compromised? And how will the farm serve its owners, employers, and customers? So a good family farm vision does several things. It's tied to your core values, which we'll talk a little bit about. It provides a guide for family making family decisions. And it describes how all the family members contribute to the success of the business. A good way to start is by asking each family member who's involved these four questions. Kind of my little grid here with the four numbers. Number one, what family values do you hold that support our continued ownership in the business? What is the business potential to create value for the family members, owners, and employees? Number three, what do the family owners expect from the business? And number four, how does the family working in the business add value? Because not everyone adds value. And that's, again, a hard thing to step back and look at and talk about it. So I alluded a little bit to core values because Part of your vision and your values is those core values, what you hold tight. That, those core values, they define how you and your employees will run the farm or business to meet your vision. They set the principles. They provide a moral compass, if you will, for you and your people. So you're sitting here going, okay, what does that mean? Well, Again, a core value could be always do the right thing, be kind, work hard, um, put people first. There's many things that businesses choose to embrace as their core values. But those core values, they help you and guide you on the right course of action, establishing a, a basis for decision making and give you some guidance even for hiring rewarding, disciplining, and firing people. So again, these if you're already in a family business and people are already on the bus, you may be thinking, well, we skipped all this part. Or we have a vision that great-grandpa set. 
Well, even if you're already behind, beyond it, it's okay to go back and sit down as a group and rehash it. Talk about it together because, again, you need to all have that same vision or at least agree on the vision. You need to agree on the core values. So it's never too late to sit down and address these items. But now we're going to get down to the nitty gritty. So because John is your son or because John is your nephew, is it automatic that he gets a seat on the management bus? We see this over and over again. We're just because they're family, they automatically become, you know, the, the owner, the herdsman, the parlor manager, something where they're in charge of many other people. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. We just have to, you know, talk about it and see if that was just an instant decision or if it was the right decision for the business and for the people. And we all have that same feeling about family. Well, no one's going to love this farm as much. No one's going to work as hard as much as family, right? And, and that is true to a point. But not everybody, again, has the same feelings or desire. So as I said before, a lot of pros and cons with hiring family. And we know it. We live it. So this isn't a surprise, right? We're not trying to say it doesn't exist. And it's not that you can't have family. It just takes more work. And that's okay. So when you're talking about pros and cons, you know, what can we do to make it better? Well, obviously, you have to manage the family dynamics. Don't just let things go and, and not deal with it goes back to communication. You'll hear me say that a hundred times. Um, you need to set boundaries. And again, that can be accomplished when you're talking about your vision and your core values. In a perfect world, before you bring family on, you would have some agreements in place so that you know what you're expecting of that person and that person who's joining the family business as management understands what their expectations are as well. That would be the perfect situation because those agreements help you deal with family conflict later on. And I always say, you know, don't forget to bring in an advisor or a trusted non-family person to kind of help with all this. Even sit on those meetings when you're talking about the values or the agreements. That's a good thing. You get an outside perspective, and it helps balance the management team, especially if the management team is having a disagreement. And so again, some of those disagreements could be, does John automatically get a seat on the management bus, right? That is a disagreement. Or if he's already got the seat and he's not doing a good job, that creates a disagreement. And so it's something you need to deal with because if you honestly just let it go and say it's family, there's nothing we can do, down the road it's going to hurt your business, it's going to hurt your employee retention, and it's going to hurt your growth. So you look like you have a question, Shelly. Are you okay? Can't hear you. Yep, I'm okay. I'm, you know, the... There's a, some of the questions that we had talked about, Liz, before. In those situations, you say address them. Yes, I think that almost every family can knows when there's that almost elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. um, but addressing them is, is difficult because it's family. You know, if it's a, it's a formal employee, I think it's a little bit easier because there's that division. Family comes to the holidays. Families around the table. Family's family. It's blood. You know, go into that a little bit deeper. Yeah, and that's true. You know, so when we are said there's pros and cons, right? Um, we, know the pro, we know what the pros are, and the cons are just what you alluded to. Um, so kind of as I said, you know, setting some of those boundaries, like how are we going to agree to act at work if we have a conflict with family? Because, again, we don't want 
the rest of our teams and vendors to see that disagreement? And what are the actions we can take to deal with it? And obviously addressing it can be difficult. And that's where I you know, brought up, you know, maybe you have a non-family uh, mediator, you have an advisor, but you bring somebody in and, and you don't just start with, this is the problem. You know, Jack's not doing his job or Jack's not being kind. You kind of go at it slowly. And by that, I mean, you, you start with just again, reaffirming what your vision and your values are and then maybe start going into things like roles and responsibility, accountability, and just kind of wash things out. And sometimes these things will rise to the top, making it easier to deal with. Because what could happen is Jack all of a sudden says, say as you're doing roles and responsibility, well, yeah, look at everything that's on my plate. I've got too much to take care of. And there's Jim over there who only has three things. That could be the root cause of some of those family issues. So taking the time to go through it and dig deep, you know, is, is really a good, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a good process, you know, to go through rather than just throwing it in somebody's face. How often is the word family used as a descriptor of reality and how many times is it often when you're dealing with um, these topics used as an excuse. Well, we have to do it because it's family, or, oh, you've got to do this because it's family, or, you know, what else is there to do? It's family, or they have always acted like that because something tragic happened in their childhood. It's family. Do you ever, you know, how do you deal with those situations? Basically, lame excuses. And you hear that probably eight out of ten times, right? And because more than anything, like I said, we want our family there. But what's happened is those people may be on the bus and shouldn't be, or they have the wrong seat on the bus. And that goes back to the fact that we're too quick to bring them back to the farm and not really pre-planning of where is this person going to fit. and. And that's what I'm going to talk about next is kind of the get it, want it, and capacity. You know, does that person have it? If it's already happened because it's, it's there, it's done, maybe it's been going on 10 or 15 years, um, again, if you want to continue to grow your business in the sense of the legacy, you want more family members to take it on or join, you really have to address it now. You have to figure out what are the issues today, what are the root causes, how can we fix it before we bring the next generation on. And we do, we make excuses because it's family. And if you were in any other business, that would not be acceptable. Mm -hmm. So we have to, you know, we've all heard that, look at this as a business. Does that kind of help you there? Yeah. Yep. I'm looking at a whole litany of questions that, you know, you kind of drew up for us. And I think they're based on a lot of case studies. I will probably stop, start going through some of those as you go back and forth. Okay. Well, let's talk about those family members, you know, being on the bus or even in the right seat. We kind of went through all this already. And I want to talk about the get it, want it, and capacity. Because this is a really good tool to use, you know, preferably before you put somebody in a position or in a seat. Um, but even afterwards, you can certainly talk about this and address it. Um, but, you know, what we're saying is they really have to get it, okay? They really have to want it. And they really have to have the capacity to do the job. So if any of those is a no, it's probably not going to be a good fit. So it's kind of a simple way to go through it. Well, what does get it mean? Well, get it means do they have, you know, do all of the neurons in their brain connect with you when you're explaining what the role is, what the task is? Are they getting it? Are they understanding it? And then are they doing the job right? 
you can tell me a hundred times how to fix a computer or you know how to even fix something electronical I will never get it okay so that's not gonna happen for me I probably don't want it either but I'm just saying so that's number one um, do they get all the ins and outs of the position so I think and I, I'm, I'm taking a step back here that's another slight problem when we bring family members on we don't always have a position right we just bring them in and that's not smart for either one of you because it's not fair to the new family member who has no idea of what their expectations are and it's not fair to you either um, so you really should define that first so again not everybody gets it just like me in electronics and that's not a bad thing they just need to be in a different seat. As they grow and develop, maybe if I would have taken a whole bunch of electronic courses, maybe today I could be saying, well, I could try it, but I know I don't want it. So anyway, let's talk about want it. Does he or she genuinely want to do the job, right? We can say, Mary, I want you to come back to the farm. You're going to be herdsman. And Mary's going, I don't know if I really want to do that. You know, maybe she has more people skills or calf raising skills. This is a full-time job, so they really have to want it. They need to want to get up every morning and go to that job. And you can't pay any sum of money to motivate them more. You can't beg enough to make them want it. So it's something they have to have. They have to want it on their own. And then we have to consider, do they have the capacity? Meaning, do they have the capabilities, the abilities to actually do the job? And a little thing you got to watch here is many might have the capacity, but again, they don't want it. So it goes back to the get it, want it. And when we talk about capacity, it's, we're talking about all the mental and physical and time, knowledge, and emotional capacity to do the job well. Karen may be excited and fresh out of college and have tons of energy to come back and take over managing all the employees. But do, does she have all the knowledge that's needed to do it effectively? The emotional capacity to handle all of that can just be thrown at her and she's going to sink. That's not good for her, it's not good for your employees, and it's not good for your business. So again, capacity can come, but it's going to take a lot of the leader's owners, the leader's or owner's time, resources, and energy to get that person ready but that can be worth the investment. So sometimes you put them on the bus, but they're in a different seat for now before you quickly move them into a management role. Okay. So one of the questions you had down here alludes to drama. Mm -hmm. Tell us about family drama and what you've seen in, in those situations. Any families that deal with, you know, that, that drama queen or king that just always constantly has to be crying about something. Right. There's, there's always someone, and I can tell you a lot of stories about, um, you know, somebody who, who I think thrived on the drama, right? And by drama, I mean maybe they're stirring the pot at work, tattling on other family owners, um, just complaining, well, you know, Pete's taking all this time off and my, I'm not getting the same time off. I think he's making more money. I'm not making the same money. All of that creates drama and frustration. And then what happens is those family members tend to communicate less and kind of drift apart and just focus on their own job and working by themselves. That's what happens because they want to avoid the drama. So again, you have to bring them back in order for that business to be truly successful and, and grow and continue that legacy. You got to find a way to bring them back and, and go back to some of those boundaries, some of those agreements 
and mainly your core values. And that can be a little difficult, not saying it's easy, but the worst thing is to, is to let it just go on. And there's what always about, a cause. So what about the all talk, no action? <laughs> we all can probably say there's someone there, right? On their farm that's all talk and no action. They know how to do everything. Um, they have the best ideas, uh, but they're never really there, right? They're not the ones actually making the change or directing or training the other employees. And again, it causes conflict. And it could be just an employee, but more often than not, it's an owner who is kind of just letting it all go to their head that, hey, I'm the owner, I'm the leader, I can just spill these ideas out, but I don't really have to do anything. And so again, I said I'm going to repeat myself a lot. It's a matter of coming back as that management team, that leadership team, and digging deep and, and going back to those, you know, those boundaries, those agreements, those core values. Um, you know, if one of your core values is hard work, let's say, well, then we all have to be giving the same, right? Um, we all have to be in on the decision making, but we also have to all be in on the execution. So what about those um, scenarios where nobody can make a decision? And usually they can't make a decision because they're afraid to. Something has happened where they're afraid to speak up, um, maybe they don't have enough information to make the decision, so they're all hoping, well, maybe Dad will just make it, or maybe Uncle Bob will just make the decision. And that will happen after a while. And then what happens is the family doesn't like the decisions, right, because they weren't in on making the decisions. So to try and have a, a process, and it's going to take time on, you know, let's talk about What's going to be our five steps to decision making? What's the first thing we need? We need information. Okay. Um, what do we need information on? What it's going to do? How it's going to be successful? What's the cost? You know, kind of make those parameters. And by having a simple guide like that, it's going to help you make decisions easier. Okay. How about this common phrase? Our family was perfect until we added the in-laws and the outlaws. That creates whole new dynamic, doesn't it? <laughs> That's a color um, book. You know, I, I was one, right? I was the in-law. I came in, um, they were probably comfortable doing the things they were doing, but what I noticed is people didn't talk. And I'm like, well, this is really weird because, you know, I like to talk and communicate. Um, I wouldn't say I stirred the pot, but I stirred it enough to make them want to understand why we didn't communicate. And so they were willing to kind of sit down and go through some personality styles training and things like that. Um, but it's also difficult in other situations where you have an in-law that comes in that doesn't understand farming, right? They don't have that connection. They didn't grow up with it. And so now all they're seeing is their husband or their wife is working all the time and all kinds of phone calls about the farm. It's another thing that you can't just let go, right? There's got to be not just communication about it, but sharing. You know, bring them, bring them into meetings to talk about the vision of the farm, the values of the farm. And as I alluded to before, some of those values could be, you know, we want X amount of time off. We want this kind of family time. And I think the more they understand, the more they're going to be receptive and accepting. It's when we tell them nothing that it creates more drama. And again, you have to remember, it's not just different generations, which it's that too, but different families. We all did not grow up the same. So you can't expect, you know, the gal down the road, even though we're in the same township, to have all of the same 
you know, values and, and work ethic that I do. We, we grew up differently. Ever run into a situation where family is important, family is everything, but your family is more important than mine? How do you handle those in situations? It, I feel like the answer is always the same um, because it, it goes back to, you know, really discussing what these agreements are. If, it's, if they're in the same type equal roles, then it should be equal pay. If something was agreed upon beforehand because one is in a higher position, then it's just revisiting that and explaining and going back into, you know, accountability and roles and responsibilities. And I guess if someone just really, really doesn't want to pull their weight and they just want all the benefit, that's a hard decision your business faces but it's something you have to, and that's, that would be the time definitely to bring in an outside mediator to dig deep into that and decide how you're going to resolve that. Okay. Okay. Well, that's just some of our questions, Liz. I'm going to keep, let you keep moving forward, and I think that you developed a pretty good um, rhetorical list here for us to keep. And I'm going to remind folks that this is an opportunity. If you're trying to figure out how to, you know, I, I kind of giggled a little bit when I saw Liz's bus. I'm like, that looks like our family bus. Um, and, but everybody has a dynamic. And this is not about being critical of one another or our families. This is about helping make families and our businesses um, more sustainable and to really help continue to improve and, and grow our processes. So lean in and ask your question. And, and again, I, you know, we all want that perfect harmony. Um, are we all going to reach it 100%? It's hard to say because, again, family dynamics and, and different people, it, it makes it difficult. But you certainly can get to a spot where, you know, everybody's happy, everybody can get along. Um, maybe you've prior to set up, you know, like I said, those boundaries of, you know, we're not going to bring family issues to the farm. We'll deal with family issues at home. But on that same note, then you have to make time as a family, too. Um, you can't always just work together at a, as a family. You got to have some fun times, too, right? Because just like with our employees, it, it helps build that rapport and strengthen the relationship. And again, you need to have that that shared vision. Um, you know, I, I'll take one farm I'm thinking of as an example. Uh, the grandfather, the father, you know, they just wanted to grow and get bigger. And the son who came in was thinking, I don't know if I want that yet. I think we really need to focus more on, you know, refining our production and our reproduction and maybe find another niche, maybe cheese making or something like that. So at first, the grandfather and the father were really mad, like, well, this is great. Why are we bringing him in? He has, you know, nothing the same as us. But once we sat down with them and, and kind of talked this through, they started to understand, you know, where the newbie was coming from. And the newbie also had a better understanding of, of where, you know, his father and his grandfather were coming from. And what happened is then as they worked together, they created a new vision, a refined vision that met the needs of all of them that they could agree upon. They created new goals that were now shared goals. Um, so it made that combination of the three generations coming together a smoother ride. And then I can't talk about this enough, but, you know, the right people in the right seats. Um, every time I see this, you know, we're anywhere from an 18 to 22-year-old is going, I'm going home to the farm, maybe I'm going to college, maybe I'm not, but I got a job and I'm going to be manager. And, of course, as parents, we want more than anything for that family member to come back and continue our legacy but they're probably not ready. 
Um, you know, I really recommend that families have their children, whether it's their own children, nieces, nephews, get some off-farm experience first for a couple years. Really learn what it's like to be an employee for somebody else. Learn what you like, what you don't like. Um, learn some of those skills of working with people that are not your family. But again, whether it's because we need that person or we're just so excited to have them back, we don't always take that step. And I would really encourage people to do that. And then when they are ready to come back, to really sit down and get a good understanding of what their, not just their skills are, but what they want to do. Because the worst thing you can do is put them in a position that they don't want because they're not going to give you their best. They're going to get upset and disgruntled. Um, and that affects, you know, other people in your business. You're not going to have the same quality of work. So you really, you want to make sure that you get them in the right seat. And even on your farm, they first should have just, just a job. Don't have them being responsible for people or an area yet. Let them acclimate and prove themselves before you move them up. And always make sure they have that get it, want it capacity. So, you know, all in all, there's so much to consider. And like I said, nine times out of ten, they're already at the farm. We already have the problems. So how can we fix it? How can we address it? And, you know, most important is communicating. You have to say, whether it's in a meeting with a mediator or on anonymous pieces of paper, but you have to say or admit what you're feeling. I'm jealous. I don't like. You know, you got to get down to it before you can address it. So that would be key. What other questions have we got? Well, we've got one that says, what, what is one one partner is doing more work than the other partner. How do you carefully address this? Yep, and again, we see that a lot. There's always one who maybe is off to Florida for four months out of the year, and the other partner that chooses, I say that because they, that's a choice to never leave, and then all of a sudden there's conflict, right? I'm always here, I'm leading, you take off, you're not dealing with anything. So I think that's where you got to kind of come to the table again and readdress what you both want out of the position, but what you both want out of the business. Um, if you can't agree, you know, if the one brother is saying, I, I don't want to be here 365 days of the year. Well, maybe that's, again, you bring in financial people or, or attorneys and advisors and you say, well, Maybe that salary gets changed. Maybe those duties get decreased. Um, maybe we buy out. You know, I can't say what the best option is for you, but you can't go on with it not being fair. And a lot of times the simple answer is just an income change. Here's one that just came in. It says, we have some of the next generation that are entitled Yet some of our family is so desperate for the farm to continue, they ignore the warning signs. Any ideas? I think we tend to say, I'm putting my own kids in this, but we see, tend to see that more entitlement with the newer generations. Um, things have been easier for them, right? We worked harder to make sure they had more than we did, and, and same with our parents working harder to make sure we had more. Um, so in a way, we kind of create that. Um, you, you know, and you, you can't just give them. that. That's not going to solve anything. And I get that you're anxious for them to be back at the farm. But there again, that's where, you know, you have to really sit down with them and reevaluate those expectations, um, whether it's duties, tasks, hours, but they all have to come back to your core values. 
how are we going to act? You know, if you're running around acting like you're entitled and I'm driving around the biggest truck, but I'm not going to stop in the parlor and help the milkers, that's setting a example to your other employees. And that's not a cohesive team. Um, so again, it's, it's a lot of talking and expectations. And, and it goes back to when I said you may have to tweak your values and core values. I think that is something that happens with each generation. And you have to come to an agreement on what those are going to be going into the next 10 or 20 years. Okay. What is D or GWC? GWC is the get it, want it, and capacity. So, yeah, we just call it GWC, but, it, you know, and that, that doesn't just pertain to family. That could be any employee that you hire. You know, those are kind of the traits and, and things you want to look at. Do they get it? Do they understand it? Do they want it? And do they have the capacity to do the job? So then the big question, Liz, is, you know, one of them that you asked rhetorically, we talked a little bit about this. What is the overall criteria for allowing family members to come back or even to grow into owners? You know, what are some things that you've seen that have worked? We've talked about all these scenarios that you've probably seen a thousand times. None of this is unique. So what's the perfect scenario? The, the ones that I've seen work the best is where, you know, early on, and I know we can't all be in that, that same position, but they knew that was important. And they wanted to design then kind of the expectations and agreements for any family members coming in. And they've really stuck to it. And... Um, this one particular farm, it was really interesting because they were young when they, you know, they were in their 30s when they decided on this. Um, and maybe it's because some of the things they went through starting the farm and, and, you know, growing it. But I thought it was really fantastic that they did it so early. And they had everything in there as far as how many jobs they had to have before they came back how many years, what type of education, um, and then once they came back to the farm, what type of roles they could have at first, what type of continued education they had to participate in, um, and kind of even a guideline of how they could move up to higher roles before there was even talk of some ownership. And like I said, that is the perfect scenario and I've just seen it work so well for them um, and everybody's in agreement and they all have an understanding it's not like a shock like it's not like one kid went off for a year and came back and said well I should have a job and they said no because you didn't meet the criteria they all knew it and understood it from the get-go you know the phrase that's coming to my mind right now and the question is leadership you know, who leads through this process, and then the phrase of, you know, lead, follow, or get out of the way kind of comes to mind. How do you balance that with this criteria? Like, who's leading this and keeping this process true? How do you do that? Well, and that has to be, in every farm is different on number of owners, but that really come, needs to start from the owners who decide to make that decision with buy-in from the leadership team. And, and, or it could be an ownership team, so maybe it's husband and wife or husband, brother, and both their wives. Um, but someone has to take the reins on it, too, just like any other task on the farm. Um, you know, this brother may be in charge of agronomy and this brother may be charge, in charge of dairy. So there has to be an agreement on who's going to take charge of this piece to, to help share the information, to help lead and guide the next generation and to train the next generation. So we have another question that's come in. It says, some in the older generation aren't contributing as much, yet they want a big salary. Is it okay to tie wages, what people do for everyone together? Their capacity is low. 
a lot of that would have to go back to how your business is structured, right? I mean, I agree with, yes, maybe the wages could be changed. That would be my gut instinct. But it, it could be that your farm set up that they're already getting uh, payments from shares or rents from land or, you know, however that was structured, which is giving them the opportunity to still have enough money or more than enough money than they need and to do less. Um, so I just wanted to preface by saying that because a lot is going to depend on that, those legalities of your business. But other than that, again, it's, it's coming down to the accountability charts. What are you going to be in charge of, you know, and what does that take up a full-time job? Is that a part-time job? But working together as a team to go through all those, those duties. And sometimes what we see, Shelly, it's, it's pretty interesting. You know, you'll have an older generation person saying, well, I don't do as much because there's nothing I'm really needed for. In reality, they've kind of taken some away assuming he didn't want that work. Well, when it came down to it, there was more that he could do and wanted to do. So mm -hmm. you can see both sides of that. Um, but again, it's something you have to have to address. All right. Very good. So Liz, as we kind of get to that, we have about five minutes left here. You know, we've talked a lot about core values and, and really addressing things. What happens when people are not living with the, living by the, the vision and the core values that have been established and agreed upon? And we see that happen. Um, and that's where you have to call them on it. You know, if you've made a decision as a family, as a business ownership group as a leadership that these are going to be the vision and the core values and someone isn't stepping up to the plate you have to address that you have to call them out on it and then just like with any employee right you provide the feedback you say you know if we don't see a change if you're not agreement into this it could come to a situation where maybe you have to part ways because you can't have values and vision and then not be following it. And, you know, I think you've all heard or seen some of the disastrous things that can happen when you don't lead by example. You're certainly not going to have the kind of caliber of employees you want. You're probably not going to be known as an employer of choice, if you will. Um, it, it's going to create a lot of havoc within your business, family, and structure. Oh, I don't hear you. <laughs> I'm saying wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Good. Very good. Work, yeah. So I mean, I'm just looking. I'm just looking down through some of our questions and the scenarios that you threw out, Liz. And I want to make sure that we cover a couple more of these. Did you have something that you wanted to add? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. One of them here I think is very common to a lot of our um, farm businesses. It says, I have two sons currently in college. They both say they want to come back to the farm. I feel one has the capacity and the other one does not. How do we handle this situation? And again, it's, it's coming back to those hard discussions, right? We can assume a child doesn't have the capacity based on what we know of them. But maybe that has changed, so you never want to assume. So my recommendation would be, you know, as a parent or whatever, to meet with them individually and really learn about what they want to do, how they see their role on the farm, and more importantly, what brings them passion, right? They may be looking at the farm and they don't even know all the jobs or they think they just want to be manager, but in reality, what brings them passion is doing the planting and harvesting. So it, it's hard sometimes when it's our kids because we just want to quickly make them happy and we want to bring them into our farm. But sometimes they're also waiting for us to say, it's okay if this isn't really what you want. 
We love you anyway. Yes. Yep. And the other one is the older generation. When is it time just to get out of the way? I can't say that yet. Um, <laughs> but it, it goes back to, you know, what, what they're bringing. And the more times you can meet and discuss these things, a lot of things happen by, via self-realization, right? They realize, okay, that's, maybe that's out of my league. I'm going to step out of the way here. Or if they still feel that need to be in on every decision and, and have more control, then it's a discussion that we have to have too is, okay, we want you to be part of this. You know, we're not throwing you out, but we also have to start allowing the next generation to try to make mistakes. And, you know, I, I heard this from a friend once and I thought it was a really good analogy. A lot of times we see the older generation hanging on to that leadership role as tight as they can because they're afraid to hand off the baton, right? And the best thing you can do is look them in the face and say, okay, if you throw me the ball, what's the worst that can happen? And they're going to go, well, you're going to drop it. You're not going to catch it. What's the worst that can happen? I drop it, I make a mistake, I learn from it, we move on. And sometimes I think the older generation just needs to be reassured of that, that there's going to be mistakes made, but we're going to learn from them and we're going to grow. And they've all made those same mistakes too, right? And that's how they got better. And if they hold on to the ball or the baton too long, no one's going to catch it. No and the farm to catch it and the business dies with them yes mm -hmm. okay. yeah all righty so as we get in these last three or four minutes Liz you know there's a lot of um, potential here for folks to just feel and, and see and kind of a, a part of this what are some things that we should be thinking about doing taking action on um, the next week or two weeks because sometimes the easiest when you learn something and you're enthusiastic about it or even if it's like putting that rock in the shoe and you know you hit something kind of close to home I better deal with it what are some of the priorities they should take out of today you want to remind us you know and I know many of us don't have much time before planting season is going to start so if you have some time now this is probably a great time to bring everybody together and just say you know these are things we got to start openly talking about. You know, you may have a vision statement. Is it the right one? Do you need to revisit that? Not many people have always set up their core values. Um, they may have them internally, but it's never been spoken and shared and, and put on paper. Goals for the farm, you know, to really just sit down as a family. And, and dig deep and talk about those things, even that discussion is then going to give you the things that you got to work on next, right? Because, ooh, well, this didn't go good, or that went really good, and we've never thought about it. So if you can make the time to just have that initial family meeting and just say, you know, we got to start addressing and looking at these things. How many of these things can really happen without a facilitator? Depending on the family, um, you know, I've seen families have really great conversations because maybe there's a in-law or something that has that ability to kind of take the lead and help walk them through it. But a lot of times, you know, they do need someone. Um, and again, that can be any trusted advisor or vendor, but just someone who isn't tied to the farm in the sense of finances and ownership. You know, so if you can get someone on the outside to come in, you're going to find those conversations go a lot better. You're going to get people to dig deeper to the root causes. Um, if you don't, what can happen is you get stuck talking about the stuff on top that bothers you, and you're never really getting down to the bottom. Not peeling the onion. Yes. Great analogy. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah. Well, as we come on that one o'clock hour, I want to say thank you again to Encore. And on top of that, I want to really say thank you to Liz Griffith for making this time with us and really spending the time walking through. Liz gave us a lot of different scenarios as she's worked for years as a consultant, seen a lot of different things. And these are things that are really uh, close to our heart. So a lot of times it's difficult for people to really toss these questions up. And we tried to make it easy today by giving some different scenarios. So hopefully we landed one close enough that you could grab on and relate to some things. But we encourage you to follow up with Liz and with Encore to really dive into some of this, especially if you're thinking that you need a facilitator. There's lots of folks in our industry. This is an industry that, or a dairy community is really the right word. This is a community that wants to see each other succeed. So if you're looking for one of those um, folks and consultants, if you're in Wisconsin, I'm really going to advocate um, the, at the Department of Ag, there's the Farm Center, the, the Wisconsin Farm Center, and they have resources and they know of other resources outside of their center that can be beneficial. And there's folks throughout the dairy community that are out there to really help you. But folks can't help you if the first step is you're just so proud or embarrassed or stuck that you're not willing to ask for help. And remember that analogy that Liz gave you, and that is if you hold on to the ball, well, if you toss the next generation the ball and they drop it, what's the worst thing that can happen? We can pick it back up as a family or as an individual or as an owner. But if you hold on to that ball forever and you never pass it, it's sure that that's the last generation that you will see in that family business. So, um, a little bit of food for thought for us all to um, kind of pull in. I want to take a moment in closing today, and uh, something was occurring to me as we were working through all of this and going back to the very beginning, but I want to first um, say thank you to our partners and our sponsors, Encore Consultants, for making today possible, all the national sponsors. And I'm going to remind everybody to go out to PDPW Prime. There's just a whole host of resources, and that's www.pdpw um, uh, forward slash prime. And it's a virtual trade show where it's got a listing of all the industry's preferred providers. And in there, you will find some resources and consultants that will help you with things like business meetings, team meetings, growing one another, and getting off of the stuck spot. So make sure that you do that. But it is in one of Dr. Seuss's books, and it's um, Lorex is the book that says, unless someone like you cares a whole lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not, for sure, it's not. And that's Dr. Seuss that said that. And he might have been talking about where we're stuck in our family businesses. Yes, nothing is more important than the people around us taking care of them in our family businesses but sometimes maybe business and family should be just a little bit more separated so that we can go together forward. With that, I'm wishing you a great, great Tuesday. This should be a sensational week wherever you're at. I hope that you have the sunshine that I have outside. Spring every single day is one day closer to being here. Thank you, Liz Griffith, and we will see you all back tomorrow on the Dairy Signal. Where, we'll, where we will be talking about how the vaccination rollout program is going across the country, get an update on this virus and when we can see a little bit more of life as we used to know it. And then later in the week, we're going to get a very dynamic update from the Dairy Innovation Hub, and that is really the research hub for the dairy industry. Very important to all of us what kind of projects are being funded, who is being brought through, the talents that are going to be coming up with the bold new ideas that are going to discover the ways around tomorrow's problems. So with that, signing out from professional dairy producers. Again, thank you, Liz. It's a privilege always to work with you. I hope you all have a super, super week.